Good afternoon, Caroline. This is our second session in less than a week, which is really good. Thank you very much for making the time for that. Um, I'm there nice to are, see you. Indeed, yes. Um, there, as I said last week, there are quite a few questions that we need to catch up on, so uh, we do appreciate you making the time to do this again. Um, I think even at the end of today, there are going to be six questions, seven questions maybe that we're not going to get to. Again, I've tried to ask the ones who have been waiting longest um, in chronological order, essentially. Um, so rather than hang about, I will just crack on and get into the, the, the first question. Um, this one comes from a colleague uh, named Jamie Campbell, who is a trainee in clinical genetics. Um, he's asked if it would be possible to, um, if some sort of document or video um, could be created that provides an easy framework for um, staff that essentially details what they can and cannot do in Office 365. Um, he states that given Teams is now integral to the work, the way we work. It would be helpful to know what we can minute, what we can record, what we can share, and even who, who we can message when we're working on that type of platform. Um, I'm not sure if something like that ex exists myself, but is there, do you have any knowledge of that, Caroline? So, no, I don't, but um, I think it's a really good point, um, and, and, and I'm sure it is, because Jamie wouldn't raise it if it wasn't. So what I'm going to suggest is, rather than waffling on with something I don't know anything about, um, is to uh, get Paul Allen to identify somebody to work with Jamie, because um, I'm not sure if what Jamie's looking is for something bespoke for trainees, or or what, what he's looking for. So, so let's get something a conversation set up between Jamie and and the right person in Paul's team, and they can work on if it or on what what if there's a gap, and um, then they can work on on what that needs to look like. But of course, we need to have guidelines and and help people understand um, how they can optimize what is available to us on three six five. So so we can set up that conversation for you, Jamie, to to help you work with whoever to to get that sorted. Okie dokie, and it's one of these ones you never know. There might actually be something, but we might just need to do a better job of flagging that to people. <laughs> um, the next one um, is something a lot of people are talking about at the moment. I know um, it's to do with um, smarter working. Mm -hmm. um, the anonymous colleague asks um, if Caroline shares their concerns about whether it's being applied Safe, uh, fairly, sorry. Um, they mentioned that the guidance states that individual staff and their line manager should um, have conversations about the service needs, about the staff members' needs, but they feel that too often a lot of staff are either told, don't worry, you can work at home for as long as you like, or probably more often, in their opinion, the manager demands staff work in the office for what seems like either convenience or performance monitoring purposes. Um, is there any comment you can offer on that, Caroline? So um, I think getting this right for everybody is really difficult. There are over 17,000 colleagues in NHS Grampian and um, all of the, you know, ranging from joiners to, to doctors to scientists to, and everybody's needs are different that's professional groups, everybody's personal circumstances are then different. So, so where I'm trying to get to, and Tom and Paul, who are leading this work from my exec team, we're trying to get to a place where we can make this as individually person-centred as possible. And, and is that being applied fairly? So, so I absolutely hope it is, um, and, and um, however I recognise that there's variation, indeed the Culture Matter survey tells me that there's variation in managers' styles and and um, the, the skills that they have, and, and, and people look at things from different lenses, so managers, I would imagine, um, will be trying to do the best to maintain services and, and try and keep their teams connected and individuals will be looking through that lens as well, but also what matters most to them. So there is a balance to be struck. Do I think that everybody will be 
utterly content with the decisions that are made? No, we, we, we can't do that. But do I do I expect decisions to be fair, to be based on consistent decision making and to respect the needs of individuals as well as services? Yes, I do. Um, I think this is quite difficult and I think um, we are trying to do it in the best way that we can. Um, but just keep having those conversations and trying to understand, not just as an individual, but as a team, what, what does that team need? Um, one of the conversations I've had with my exec team is the preferences of individuals, but actually what others in the team need from them. Um, so, so it might be somebody's individual preference to work more remotely, but actually other members of the team need that physical contact with them for whatever reason. Um, so keep talking um, is my, is my uh, uh, that's how I'm doing it, because I've got to do it with my team as well. Um, uh, although I, I recognise that we're in a pretty privileged position in regards to being able to control how we do most of our work. Um, but yeah, I do expect it to be applied fairly. Um, and if you have ongoing concerns about that, then um, uh, speak to the HR hub um, and they can provide you with some additional advice on how to handle that. Yeah, and I think it's one of the one of the things that I was pleased about was that there wasn't, you know, it wasn't a diktat that everybody must work from home or everybody can come back or must come back from now. And it's probably just one of the challenges of um, doing it the, the way that we have that there is an element of choice in, in that consistency is, is something that we just yeah, I mean that that's that's so so that's the important point Mike um is I, I don't want us to be an organization that dictates from the top this is how you'll do it but actually in regards to does everybody get exactly the same then that's the only way to do that but what I know is that every individual needs something different to be able to do what they need to do so so yeah I think you're right, I think the way we're doing it in trying to personalise it can increase the risk of people perceiving that they're not being treated fairly. Um, and, and yeah, there's a balance there, isn't there? But um, absolutely trying to give individuals and teams the power and the authority to do what matters to you and your service users. So um, yeah, keep trying. Okay, um, the next one comes from uh, a consultant colleague, um, Roger Staff, he asks, it's just a short one, he asks, when will NHS Grampian provide an MRI radiotherapy treatment planning service? I don't know enough about radiotherapy to know what that is exactly, but I don't know if you do, Caroline. Um, so I do, but I don't know um, an MRI. Just repeat the question to me, MRI planning. Yeah, so it's a, an MRI radiotherapy treatment planning service. Right, again, I'm not going to spend time waffling um, uh, around that and um, I am going to get um, Rafa, whose name I have complete, second name I have completely forgotten, um, but I managed to spend quite a bit of time with him looking at uh, radiotherapy services recently. So the, the clinical director um, for uh, radiotherapy um, uh, to answer that consultant's question directly, um, I, I, I don't know is the answer, but what I do know is um, through my conversations with Rafa and um, the, the team in, um, uh, uh, those areas, the teams in those areas, is the importance of radiotherapy in our pathways of care is critically, um, it's vital. So I absolutely know that those conversations are, are there. The priority of these services are in the forefront of people's minds, but I'm not sure of the timing. So Rafa is the person to answer that. I'm sure this consultant colleague will know Rafa, um, uh, but um, I'll, I'll ask him for a specific answer. OK, thank you. Um, the next one comes from a lady called Jeanette, who is a staff nurse. I don't want to give her a second name because she didn't actually mention whether she wanted to be anonymous. So I won't, I won't say that, but just a reminder to people if you indicate one way or the other um, and we'll follow that. Um, the question itself, though, is um, mentions that during the COVID pandemic, um, staff were encouraged in certain areas to shower before they left the hospital premises um, to help with infection control, and that many staff are still doing that. Um, it's a good practice, essentially. Um, 
Jeanette highlights the, the shower facilities and the changing rooms in the yellow and pink zone corridor in particular as needing modernisation, um, even down to little things like a folding seat would help with drying. Um, she says that um, she feels the staff lockers in this area could be doing with looking at um, and essentially says that um, even if there were more showers, more people would be able to use them quicker. Um, it, essentially, is there anything that um, you're aware of that we're looking at to support um, the shower facilities or improve them? No, I, I'm not aware of any current work around it. And this is the first time, um, Janet, that, that I've heard that. So pre-pandemic, I knew there was quite a lot of discourse about um, changing rooms and the, the, whether they were good or whether there was enough access, et cetera, to lockers and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I haven't been in those changing rooms actually for a couple of years. Um, so what I will do is get Gavin Payne to confirm if there is any ongoing work and then um, probably, uh, Janet, get Gavin, as long as you're, you're content with this, um, get, Jan get Gavin to reach out to you to just hear your specific thoughts on what could make a difference quickly. Um, as with everything, um, using public money, uh, we've got to think really carefully about that, but actually um, uh, balancing that with things that really frustrate colleagues. So you're the first person I've heard that from. Um, let's see if it's broader and, and what what it would take to to uh, make it more useful. Um, but we'll speak to Gavin and again, make that connection between you and him. So I'm not going to put anything back in the brief about this. I'm just going to directly set up a conversation for you and Gavin. Okie dokie. Thank you, Caroline. Um, the next one is um, another hot topic and I think something that we were roughly asked about last week. Um, Fiona Brebner from Research and Development, she asks um, about many staff, essentially many staff are returning to their desks at the moment um, and parking is becoming more and more of a problem and it will obviously continue to be the case. Um, well, she asks, will the parking available in the multi-storey car park at ARI on floor six and above become permanent or will, or will the old parking permit system be introduced, reintroduced? Um, I think then she goes on to point out that um, that's been well used um, during the pandemic, but she worries that staff who don't qualify for a parking permit under the old system um, will consider whether they can continue working here if that privilege is removed when they're compelled to pay what is over £100 a month to park in the streets round about and then points out the, the stress that um, sometimes not even finding a space in those streets causes. Um, are you aware of what the plan of action is around that, Caroline? Um, so, no, but what I am aware is parking is becoming an increasing issue. So there's a couple of things on this. So firstly, I'm going to start with, and I'm sorry if this irritates people, but but the big the big thing about climate sustainability and our absolute requirement to be thoughtful in every decision about how we as an organisation um, uh, enable the, the net zero position that we have all been challenged with. And I don't need to rehearse that. I think we all know why why that is really important. So so what are the alternatives um, um, to to everybody um, uh, bringing their car to work. Indeed, in, in some in, uh, circumstances, some families um, who I'm delighted are working with us, but bringing three cars to to park on, on our site. So there's something about um, how do we each consciously think about what are the best options? Um, and I recognise fully um, the challenges of, of managing um, a, a commuting and and um, dropping kids off and other commitments, etc., that people have. So there is a balance, and and that's why it has to be individualised. Um, so I think the the specific question about level six, I don't know the answer to, but um, Paul Allen will know the answer to that. Um, clearly, most colleagues will know that the agreement that we got um, from from the, the purpose of that um, multi-storey on the Forester Hill campus was about patients and visitors. That's why it was funded in the way that it was. Um, 
and I know that parking for colleagues is is a real issue um, and, and that's that's really important that we do the best we can um, around that. So um, we will be able to confirm if we know or not um, the exact answer about level six. I would imagine um, Paul, um, uh, Paul or indeed colleagues and his team will be in negotiations um, around that at the moment. Um, and I think that Relating to the last question about smarter working, um, we need to think about what smarter working means in regards to car parking. And um, with as with everything, um, there is an opportunity for us to reflect on the allocation of permits and actually understand if that is fair and just with what we know now and, and what we're trying to do now. So really good question, really important um, and uh, uh, something that is ongoing in, in the work that we're doing, trying to get the right amount of car, car parking capacity. We are never going to be able to have, the there's never going to be empty spaces. Um, so we have to be really tactical and, and, and thoughtful about how we do this. Um, uh, so um, yeah, ongoing work, but we'll come back with the specific around level six. Thank you, Caroline. Um, the next question is on, well, it was submitted on behalf of several nursing colleagues in Aberdeenshire, um, none of whom want to be named, but their question is, um, why is a district nurse expected to hold a master's qualification for a band six role, yet um, some of the advertised lead nurse posts at 8A um, having a degree is defined as only a desired requirement. They comment that how do we expect to attract and retain district nurses who hold advanced skills and independent prescribing when other cl clinical areas seem to recognise their skills with higher bandings? Yeah, uh, a really interesting question and not a new debate. Um, so uh, I think we should be supporting all colleagues um, to be uh, undertaking the education that that they would like to take, undertake. And um, I'm surprised actually that um, uh, for that level of senior practice um, 8A that, uh, that you're pointing out that that all all that's being asked is um, a is, is a degree as opposed to um, a master's and. Um, I'll get June Brown um, or Jane Ewan to follow that up. The specifics around masters for district nursing and um, and other masters and how that equates. So undertaking a masters does not equate to a level of pay, um, but of course the the, um, the the requirement to ensure that people are able to practice at master's level um, and, and be remunerated um, appropriately is really important. So I think this is a conversation for um, June Brown, Jane Ewan and the lead nurses in the health and social care partnerships to work through consistency and um, uh, how that's going to work um, going forward with the opportunities, that huge opportunities that there are for advanced practice and, um, and district nursing um, as, we, as we move into uh, new models of care. But um, really good question from Aberdeenshire colleagues can understand the frustration and would suggest that they speak to Ali McGruther and Jane Ewan to really understand what's going on there and and how they can um, how they can understand uh, what what else can be done because um, I think people are at work and they perceive things to be unfair it's not a great place to be so so yeah um, pick the conversation up with your lead nurse Ali McGruther and invite Jane into that conversation. I think it yeah, that comes back to one of the things you said before, but it's it's about explaining the why that's the important thing for people a lot of the time. So, um, the next one is again anonymous. Um, it's about the health visiting service. Um, the person mentions because they're on the amber pathway. Um, after visiting a baby, the team um, uh, between six and eight weeks, they don't visit again until thirteen months, unless there's a cause to do so. Um, they ask when NHS Grampian will provide a statement that the teams can point to that um, for parents, for, for the public, to let them know about the, the visiting capacity they currently have. Um, the person mentions they get so many upset 
parents phoning looking for weight reviews and general guidance and, and they're frustrated about having to tell people things like go buy your clothes at clothing size or refer them to parents groups on the internet um, she feels that getting rid of drop-in clinics has been a, a mistake um, and it feels very unnatural that health visitors aren't getting to visit when they're needed needed it does doesn't it when you describe it um like that mike um so so again it's been some time since around this so so june brown needs to pick this up and um uh, and and um, can do that through the uh, lead nurses so um sam fiona and ali across murray shire and city but in essence i think this will stem from I'm not sure if this is stemming from the universal pathway the comment about um not seeing people in clinics so so that was um, a national direction and I know there was a lot of frustration and concern about the unintended consequences of of that um, but June and the, the lead nurses will be able to pick that up with you um, and the other aspect is around reduced if indeed reduced visiting capacity I can't remember the the, the universal pathway visiting times but um, uh, if it is reduced because of COVID my position is there should have been a grampian statement from the outset about that so so i'm not quite sure why there isn't one if there isn't one um and as soon as possible getting back to professionals being able to use their discretion to do the right thing for families and children um is is where we need to be so again i would encourage you to please pick that up with the lead nurses and june as the executive nurse director um to, to help you understand um, uh, how how to work how to work around that and make sure that um, I mean there is there is something about trying to protect you and your workload here, but there is also something about we know that families, individuals, parents um, have different needs. So so one size does not fit all, and that's why you're professionals to be able to make those judgments. So yeah, um, really good point, and uh, would 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 just ask that you pick it up with your lead nurse and June, please. OK, thank you, Caroline. The next one is again anonymous. Um, it's from a colleague who mentions they've had support from Gramp NHS Grampian IT as well as show to set up a departmental website. Um, however, um, they feel they're spending valuable clinic clinical time developing the website themselves, which could be done more efficiently by staff with an IT background and um, the question essentially is would NHS Grampian be able to consider increasing the amount of support it offers for web and development? Gosh these questions are diverse aren't they? they really so, are, yeah. so so right okay um absolutely I can understand so if you've invested in setting up setting up a website and and that's been because you've been motivated to do it and um you're now having to maintain that website um that that is a challenge and and if i was to have a conversation with scott sim um from eHealth, then that is the challenge the challenges we have colleagues with the best of intentions that set up these the websites and then the ability to maintain them and keep them contemporary is really difficult the evidence of that is we have multiple websites that public um, that the public can access and they're not kept up to date so that's pretty high risk so i'm not sure actually I've, I've not been around conversations about this for some time how we are governing or managing um uh, prioritizing website website maintenance um, of course the answer is a clinician should be um, undertaking clinical work and advising on what goes on and a, and a person who is expert, um, a colleague who is expert in website uh, uh, design and maintenance should be doing that. But the reality is, as I, I as as you know, is is um, uh, our uh, financial constraints around having huge support teams. So there's something about um, there's something about understanding where we're at with that and what we can do just now, but recognising what is what is the future plan for websites in this organisation? How are we going to make them the best they can be and how are we going to make sure they maintain um, their contemporary information and stuff? So, sorry, Mike, was that individual anonymous? 
Uh, they were, yeah. Um, right. So, sorry, if, so if you know who they are, um, then if you could reach out to them and say, let's understand your specific needs. I'm sure that will open up a can of worms, but we've got to start somewhere. So, so let's understand your specific needs and what to see if we can help. Um, and if not, I think we've got a bigger issue around people setting up websites and and then not being able to maintain them. Yeah. Um... I've been involved in some of that work and I know earlier this year there was essentially a, a, a risk and checklist that was developed okay. um, for people setting up external websites and that was part part of the process of trying to make sure they were maintained, that we did have some sort of governance over them. Um, but I think it's still very much something that's developing as we go. So um, yeah, I can help facilitate that. Um, and then the final question I think today is actually probably more one for me, although feel free to answer it yourself if you want, Carly. Um, it's something that we've been asked about a few times. Um, people are asking if we could put this um, Q&A on Spotify or iTunes um, as a podcast, essentially, an audio version that they can listen to in the car. Um, so we're looking into that. But, uh, didn't know anything about it myself, but um, there's a whole process you've got to go through to get onto these platforms. Um, but what we've done in the meantime is put it on a, a, a site called SoundCloud that people can have a look at. Um, it's not as good as Spotify or iTunes um, by the looks of it, but it should help in the meantime. So that just to make people aware that we, we are looking at that. Um, but at that point, unless you want to add anything on that, Caroline, I think we'll probably stop it there for today. Um, as I said at the start, it, there are quite a few other questions that we've got to get to, so we'll try and do another Q&A within the next couple of weeks. Um, and thank you to people for their patience and cooperation and for, as Caroline mentioned earlier, such a diverse set of questions. So thank you very much and thank you, Caroline. Yeah, it's a pleasure as always, Mike. I think that you said if I've got anything else to say, I think the only thing I'm going to say is, again, just how useful I find this. And actually, although I know, um, uh, uh, as we all do, the increasing cost of living and the consequences of that, um, I'm not sure that I, I think this really helps bring to life um, this. So in particular, um, this session and the last session, um, that we did around, you know, the, what does that actually mean for people? And um, yeah, um, it, it's really provoked quite a bit of thinking about how can we support people to be at work, actually? Um, and, and there's a real theme coming across um, how worried people are. And that's at the beginning of these fuel uh, uh, increase um, hikes. So I think, yeah, just really useful and, and pretty thought provoking, actually. I know this is it's obviously going to be an issue over the next few months and a lot of us still haven't had this quarter's electricity bill in which is when the the, the real um challenge will start to be seen i think so yeah i know even last night with my wife we were considering we both work at home and things like having two laptops running all day you think is that going to start to mount up so yeah, it's going to be a challenge. But again, thank you very much, Caroline, and we will see you all shortly. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Take care. Bye.